there's a lot going on in Australia when it comes to quantum technologies. Uh, you've just come out with a new national quantum strategy, complete with funding, or at least promised funding. Um, these are big steps. Um, what can you tell us about this strategy? What are the, what are the highlights? Kathy, well, hi, Jim. First? Yeah. yeah, sure. It's great, great to be here and talking about the Australian National Quantum Strategy. And the reason why it's exciting is that this isn't something which we did overnight. It's something which is a culmination of decades of work that's come about in Australia. Most people don't realise that that you know, we, we've actually had research going on um, with a, more than a billion dollars worth of investment, not just from government, but others as universities and states, state governments, and also from, um, from uh, international companies and, and countries and also industry. And as a consequence, we've, we're for a small country, we're only 0.3% of the world's population. We have uh, a re we're in the top six countries with uh, efforts in, in quantum. And the reason for that is this patient long-term investment so what happened uh, as a consequence of that, and it came out of, uh, a lot of it came from the Australian Research Council Centre of Excellences, where they've had 15 centres of excellence and over that 23 period, year period or 20 year period, uh, where they're either quantum focused or quantum adjacent um, centres of excellence, which has meant that we've built up a really big uh, cohort. So we've got capacity as well as a whole range of different things happening. So. In um, 2018, uh, there was an Australian Institute of Physics Congress in Perth, and I was asked, because I was working in CSR at that time, if I could help bring the community together, because you know what academics are like, they're always competing and trying to uh, get more of the, more of the money. what C0 is for the audience. Yeah, what's our CSIRO is the Commonwealth Scientific Industrial right. Research Organization, so it's our, okay. our national research agency. And at that stage, I'd, I'd been working um, in uh, superconducting electronics, but actually gone up the the, the chain of mm -hmm. um, and bit was chief scientist of the organisation at that stage. So I had a little bit of the, of the levers to pull, and so I was able to bring together um, bring together uh, CSIRO to create a roadmap, which we we launched in 2020, and it was done in a collaborative way, talking to everyone. And it showed that it was a huge opportunity uh, to see Australia have a quantum industry, even though we're a relatively small country. And so then uh, this took the interest of the federal government and uh, successive governments, and uh, particularly with the new government that uh, was elected 12 months ago, they wanted us to double down on create a quantum strategy. And, uh, and it was released in May, uh, which is pretty fast for something to be developed that quickly. And the reason why it happened so fast was the appetite and the um, engagement of the Australian research community, uh, quantum research community. And what we came up with were five things, some of them which you are uh, probably the same as every other country who's got mm -hmm. a quantum strategy. Uh, there's about 16 countries in the world that are really doubling down on quantum. And so it's a fairly um, a specialist lot of countries or, or uh, you know, sort of a club, I guess. And they realised that we've you've first of all got to have a thriving research and development um, in order to be able to do this, and as well as having uh, investment and um, in uh, industries and being able to make that come together, because this is something where some of the technology is ready to go, like sensors, some of the cybersecurity stuff, some of the comm stuff. But the quantum computing aspects of it, we've got early stage quantum computers, but we're not really hitting the mark on the quantum advantage or, or um, that, that we're expecting. So that was the first one. And you could say, oh, well, that's, of course, what you're going to do. The second one, of course, is uh, making sure we have the skilled workforce and, um, and that we keep growing it. So Australia has actually graduated um, two and a half thousand PhDs in quantum in the last 20 years which is 10%, um, I think, of the quantum workforce in the world. <laughs> so it's about, yeah, so there's not that many people who are trained up in this area, and this is a huge issue. So we've got to really, and it's not just the people with PhDs, we've also got to start looking at, you know, who are the, going to be the technical people that are going to be doing the electronics and the cryogenics and all that sort of stuff. Hey, Kathy, and, how did that happen? I mean, that's sort of amazing. Oh, uh, that was the centers of excellence were uh, all focused on training students as, and students do a lot mm -hmm. of the research. And that's how that came about. 
um, uh, because these, these centres of excellence are very well funded. The government gives them about $35 million over a seven year period. And then they mm -hmm. leverage that sometimes two and a half times by attracting other funding and support, whether it's in kind or real cash. And as a consequence, you've got these mega groups and there's been 15 of them. One of them, and some of them are still in existence and some are, um, we just appointed a new one on uh, quantum biotechnology last year. So, mm. so that's something where that workforce has come from. So if you look at a lot of the uh, US companies, they've actually got Australian trained people running the show and mm. in China as well, actually. So, um, so if you look at uh, Jay Gambetta, um, uh, as yeah, an example, we've had them on the series. Yeah. So, uh, and, and, and you know, if you if you name any company, you'll find an Australian uh, or someone who's Australian trained there. So that's that's really important. The next one is uh, making sure that we have access um, secured to essential quantum infrastructure and materials. And of course, you know, you've got to have the um, the hardware around it. If you're building the hardware, it's one thing doing software. But you still have to have access to computing. Uh, you still have, um, you know, for example, uh, some of the quantum simulations done on very large computers, and uh, so high performance computing as we're doing some of the simulations. So the access to that, uh, clean rooms, uh, the uh, the materials that are needed to deliver on that. So that's going to be really important. And then the next two, I think, are, are probably a little bit different. Oh, the first one is making sure we've got the standards and the frameworks to support the national interests. And there's on, on a couple of them. One is, of course, you know, if we're creating a new industry, you've got to have trade standards so that everyone's talking the same thing, interoperability. But also when we're, as a scientist, uh, working in superconducting electronics, there's a whole lot of basic measurements that people do differently. And we're comparing notes and, and quality of devices and we're actually measuring different things. So there's some really basic stuff that has to be done there. And that's not just in Australia, but internationally. And, um, and then, of course, the final one, which is something which is um, probably a bit more um, important for Australia, because uh, we're, uh, and I've just done a national conversation looking at what are the priorities for Australia. We've, I've been asked to support the government on developing a refresh of the science and research priorities. And Australia has a really deep value system of being a liberal democracy that is also having ethics, equity, our role in the area, in the region being something as, um, as really deeply important. So the fifth pillar or theme in our, um, in our strategy is one that's trusted, ethical and inclusive. Because if you remember how I said there's only 16 or so countries that are doubling mm -hmm. down on it, that means yeah. there's 100 and something, you know, 70 countries that aren't. And if we're going to, if this is going to be such a big technology that will be transforming the world in the way that the first and second quantum revolutions did. This one is going to be one which we need to make sure uh, doesn't end up with the haves and haves not, that it's done in a way that's ethical. And it's one which is done in a way that we build trust and bring the social license of the community along with us. And so that's one of the bits I'm very proud of in the strategy, because I think this is something which we often leave out as we're rushing ahead because we're so excited about the tech. So sorry, I've gone on a long time, but I thought it might be useful to give it a context. <laughs> no, that was great. Uh, you gave us a good overview of the strategy and there aren't that many countries with quantum strategies. So it's impressive that Australia, I saw that the first Australian researchers were in the late fifties. I, I think that's, most people wouldn't guess that. Yeah. So No, that's right. So some of those initial, particularly yeah. in uh, quantum photonics, that sort of yeah. thing, and also semi, uh, super, superconductivity as well. Um, oh. So some of the first superconducting breakthroughs and also cryogenics uh, developments in Australia. Oh. So we've, we've got some little surprise packets. That's, uh, <laughs> and uh, and you know, superconductivity goes back a long way. It's one of the first areas of quantum that really took off. So one of the and things Kathy, I... Go ahead, Kathy, go ahead, Joanna. Yeah. Kathy's being very modest here. She has also made a very significant contribution before she became Australia's chief scientist to the field of quantum computing. So um, I'll just shout that out uh, for her. Uh, <laughs> it's very kind of you. Thanks, Joanna. <laughs> she paid you to say that, right? She did not. <laughs> <I> did <that>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let me go back to a question that might be a little more uh, broader than the strategy. But one thing I always wonder about is you have research very often done by governments, part of a national strategy. And you've got to figure out some way to link that to business competition. 
And in some of our allies, we've had a dilemma in some technologies where the who owns the IP down the road, who gets the commercial development. And I remember getting the actual agreement in one case was relatively quick, working out the, the ownership of the IP and the, the business opportunities. That took three years. So when you think about how you're going to move ahead with uh, the research partnerships, first in Australia with the Australian private sector, what are you thinking here? How do you link research to competition? Do you want to do that, John, or that's sort of in your uh, bailiwick? Yeah, sure. Look, I think just to pick up on a couple of points that that Kathy made, which for for a uh, audience in the US, it really is to emphasize that when it comes to quantum computing, Australia has companies that are already operating and looking to commercialize products across from quantum sensing to uh, quantum communications. Uh, quantum post quantum encryption and also uh, a lot of work going on in quantum computing and I think you know I'm now a professor at the Australian National University before that I did a lot of work uh, with government and worked for government and this is one of the areas where Australia genuinely does punch above our weight so we're very proud of it and rightly so we, we you know we often talk a big game in Australia about various things I think in quantum we don't talk a big enough game about the wins that we have um when it comes to how do you how do you take all of that work including with the research centers that Kathy was talking about and move into commercialization I think the key challenge around this, particularly in the Australian context, is funding. And this strategy, um, there was an enormous amount of interest and uh, goodwill and engagement um, and, and a real effort made by Cathy and the team to engage with the quantum industry. Um, and I think the, the, the question now is how do we fund that? How do we actually ensure that this really ambitious and bold vision of, for example, one of the, um, one of the uh, statements in it is that, a, that the first error computed error corrected quantum computer is built in Australia. That's a big ambitious yeah, goal. Yeah. And it's wonderful, right? That's really, you know, most of the time when you have a government document, they're like, oh, that's too bold. Let's like water that down. So it's it's extraordinary having that level of ambition. And now how do we ensure that there's the level of funding uh, to uh, to allow for the for that um, to actually happen? And I guess my my one concern that I have, and I'd be interested in Kathy's view on this, is mm -hmm. we're talking about the the long term sustained steady investment that Australia has had in quantum in this field, and we are continuing that. Right, we, we've there's um, we have our national reconstruction fund which has fifteen billion dollars. Um, at least one million dollars, one billion dollars of that is earmarked for critical technologies, and some of that will go to quantum. So there's a, there's a lot of steps in that, um, and uh, the we, at the same time we're looking at um, the UK um, with a two point five billion dollar um, billion dollar pound billion pounds. Sorry, <laughs> too many uh, too many different currencies involved in that. Germany is doubling down, um, the US is investing, you know, and China is just in a, another order of magnitude, right? So, you know, when we're talking about one or two billion, the numbers coming out of China are around 15 billion. Um, so I guess my question is, is this the sort of slow, incremental, steady going to actually sustain Australia's position in leadership as others recognise um, the opportunity uh, that is here. Um, and, you know, I think we have much more of a base than many of these other countries, and that's a real advantage for us. Um, and of course, for Australia, it's also about how do you secure that inward investment, which is also something that is a feature uh, of the strategy as well. Cassie, mm. did you want to add to that? Yeah, so look, that's a really good point. One, if you look in the strategy, what we do have in it, which is a bit unusual, is identifying that, yes, the government's putting some funding in, which is earmarked for quantum, but it's also got a whole range of different programs in place. So instead of popping up something different, which also often is a delay in getting it up and going, they've earmarked different funds in different programs that are there already, uh, as well as the, uh, the Minister Husik, who, who's really driven this strategy and being the, you know, sort of the real um, sponsor and champion for it. Uh, has been that saying this is just the beginning. So this isn't something which is a set and forget. 
and knowing that the funding that's there so far is just the start because you, you've got to, it takes, one of the things I've learned being in this role uh, um, is it takes, government can't, it makes an announcement, but actually delivering on the announcement can take a very long time. And uh, and because Quantum's got a, you know, sort of between 30 and 40% uh, percent annual, compound annual growth rate, we can't afford to be waiting while, you know, the public service goes through its process of winding things out. Reality is they have to do that because it's government public funds. So what we've identified is a whole lot of things that are in existence now that we can hook into now. And um, and so, for example, there's um, just in the process of uh, finalising something which is initiated by the previous government and now finalised by this government is what's called the Australia's Economic Accelerator, which is a um, investment into um, into university research that's been identified as potentially spin out a ball and taking it up that sort of up through the valley of death to the point where it's investable. So. So that's something that's there already, and quantum is one of the thing, one of the few areas that they've earmarked for that. And um, and there's the centers of excellence, not centers. Yes, there's the ARC centers of excellence. There'll be another round, and I imagine they have to go through a competitive process. So you also don't want to be funding something which ends up with you know substandard things. You've got to make people a little bit hungry because one of the things I've noticed is if you spray money too much, uh, you actually end up with people becoming complacent. And um, so you've got to get that balance between enough, but not too much, which I think is really important. And you've got to be competitive. And then there's also our cooperative research um, centers where there, there's the potential to apply for that. And also the, uh, the, the uh, CRCPs, which is a smaller project specific um, granting program. So they're just an example of them. And then you've also look at all the states and territories have got a range of different uh, programs being set up so uh, Breakthrough Victoria, for example, has um, already made some investments into, um, into uh, some quantum initiatives. You would have seen inflection coming into Australia, funded by uh, with $25 million for uh, setting up um, uh, fabrication and, and engaging with universities in Victoria. Uh, we've also got Main Sequence Ventures, which is a, um, a uh, investment arm of CSIRO, which has uh, been set up with funding from the Wi-Fi windfall and also initially from government funding and CSIRO funding. And now it's now it's just standalone and has investors funding. And it's been a very successful company and it's invested in a number of quantum companies. And the ones that they've invested in have really grown like Q-Control, Quantum Brilliance, and they have now becoming global companies. So, um, so I think it's it, the thing that often we have to be careful of is the Australian ecosystem of government, industry, and um, research is actually very different to pretty much every other country in the world. Mm. And so, um, just putting a you know a bag of money on the table in the way that other countries have done would not necessarily work in our environment. And I'm not trying to sort of make excuses, but I'm just this is a reality: <laughs> is that um, the ambition is there, the recognition you have to invest. But also uh, knowing that we've got an, a sort of a, 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 a spectrum of different ways of doing this, and we want to make sure that we're not just setting up a whole new thing, which then, in my experience, has been new things come and go. And this, we've got to have long-term stuff, which is immune to you know changes of government, changes mm -hmm. of ministers, and that sort of thing. And so I hope that's what we've achieved here. One of the things that I was going to ask about, and you brought it up, is in the numbers in the US aren't always reflective of the actual investment because the private sector actually spends more on quantum than the government, yeah. at least the, the open figures, right? So when you look at places like Google, IBM, there's a whole startup community now around quantum. So very, very energetic field. And, you know, how does it work in Australia? I mean, what's the, I'm, pardon the expression, but it's a shorthand. What's the innovation in what's the innovation ecosystem in Australia, and how does quantum hook into that? Because one of the things you know, people tend to look at the disparity between U.S. spending and Chinese spending. That changes when you throw in private sector spending, and that mm -hmm. actually gives us a little bit of an advantage. One thing we're all so I noticed in this strategy, you talked a fair amount about sensing. Sensing looks like a place where people are going to be able to commercialize pretty quickly. Other things are a lot further out, perhaps much further out, but 
when you think about where quantum fits into Australia's innovation ecosystem, how would you describe that? And that's probably a question for both of you. Right. I've been talking a lot, Joanna. What if you kick off and then I'll follow? <laughs> we can cut that later. By the way, I should say, as long as we're doing a cutout, um, our, our audience is not only American, we have sort of a global audience, including China. So just keep that in the back. Oh, perfect. Mind. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, look, I think Australia's innovation ecosystem is unique. And Cathy's just explained that in particular with the, the relationship between research industry and government. It is, um, you know, I think we have a much, um, it's quite different. We don't have, for example, a DARPA-like institute, although we, we have just established um, a defence um, fund. Um, but we do have these research centre of centres of excellence, which really do drive a lot of Australian innovation. So, um, which then tends to lead to spin outs that lead to companies. So, one of the companies that uh, Kathy was talking about just then, Q Control, um, is a spin out from a university, for example. Um, so we do we do um, that that is quite a common when we, when it is deep research that leads to um, an innovative tech product. I think the other big difference in Australia to uh, the US is we don't have that enormous private sector investment that happens in the US that you're talking about on the same scale. And so Australian uh, Australian companies or the innovation ecosystem, when they do get to that point where they spin out, um, they are largely dependent on um, uh, capital raising from overseas. So a lot mm. of the funding comes from overseas. Um, and so I think here, one of the key things, and this is covered in the strategy and recognised as a need to do this, is, well, how do we ensure that we've got the right incentives and regulatory frameworks in place to be attracting that kind of investment? And this has come out a lot as well in the context of Quad, um, in the context of AUKUS um, and cooperation that's going on among uh, the various groupings of countries. How do we actually prioritise and make it easier for us to invest in each other's industries when it is a strategic priority and identified as a strategic priority? Um, and that came out very strongly. Uh, I attended the Quad uh, Investors Summit in Sydney uh, late last year. And it really was a key theme that we need to look at these regulatory barriers that are um, inhibiting uh, investment. Um, you know, in Australia, for example, um, for, for uh, main sequence ventures is probably one of the only large um, uh, uh, investment um, uh, companies that exist. And, and it, when I say large, it's um, quite small on the scale um, of uh, US um, investment firms. So how do, we, how do we leverage the networks that we have and the partners that we have to be able to attract that investment? Um, and, it, and it is something that I'm particularly interested in and focused on um, mm -hmm. and was very pleased to see it flagged in the strategy. Yeah. And when we're talking about the Australian ecosystem, um, quantum ecosystem, it's really interesting. We've sort of, I always call it Australia a bit of a Goldilocks uh, sized country where we're big enough to be able to, um, to do something of scale, um, but we're small enough so that we're actually able to connect in a way where everyone is connected. And it's, it's not a behemoth. So that's really hard to know who's doing what and had that level of coordination so we've got you know of course you've got to have a little bit of competition and you know rivalry we, we, that's really important that you know that, that excites the human condition to really push hard and and compete but the other thing though is extraordinary cooperation as well so for example we set up the national quantum advisory committee NQAC, we call them uh which is um a, got a, a whole lot of uh quantum specialists, but we also have an ethicist and uh, people from, uh, someone from startup, um, from the VC world. And uh, and the whole idea is to use that committee to really provide advice to the government on uh, some of the things that are needed to be able to make, uh, make the changes that are necessary to support the opportunity. And uh, and so that's I, I think that's one where it's pretty unusual to have uh, usually you know when you have advisory committees you've got to be careful of conflict of interest and things like that and uh, and this is one where um, I, I've been really impressed with the way everyone's engaged where it's not about how can I use this to leverage my situation 
It's actually how can I leverage this to lift the 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 opportunity in the country, and uh, and I think that's that's pretty amazing and also been very helpful. And the other is to all we've got um, uh, states and territories. Uh, we only have eight of them, so it's not as many as the US, but uh, but we are a federation of states and. Each state's got their thing, and and as and their ter and the territories have got ambitions for things as well. And it's really interesting when you look at what the focus is around all the different states and territories. It's it's not all on one thing. So there's a New South Wales has the biggest collection. They've got one of the biggest collections of quantum scientists in the world uh, around the Sydney Basin area. And um, and then you've got I think there's more than a thousand. Um, quantum engagement people there or something it's quite large and then you've got um, Queen, um and they're they're doing a whole range of things from quantum computing based on silicon spin through to uh, sensing uh software that so they're pretty much uh comprehensive but in in victoria you've got uh diamond mv diamond you've got um uh, a really strong uh quantum simulation software development uh, and and in Queensland you've got really strong sensing. In um, in Adelaide you've got really strong timekeeping. So so then they, everyone's been able to say this is my my big thing. So it's almost like a um, a, a peak in an area, but it doesn't mean they're exclusive. And they've got they've got bits in other areas, and they collaborate across because those centers of excellence are not around a single person or a single organisation. They're actually across many universities and also government funded agencies and also international and also engaging with industry. So they're quite an amazing um, approach, which was started in 2003. And other countries have seen how uh, uh, successful they are and have tried to emulate them. There's also one other thing which Australia has, which most other countries don't have, is a uh, Commonwealth Scientific Industrial Research Organisation, CSRO, which is a public funded agency. and um, and it's sort of a um, something where their role is to help research translation, and mm -hmm. and what you're seeing is a real step up there and a huge investment from CSIRO on uh, seeing how to implement the quantum opportunity as well and what's needed to support the development of the ecosystem. So we've got a couple of things there which I think are, are special for Australia that makes us a bit different from other countries, but um, we're hoping that we can bring that all together. And we're sort of seeing this to really amplify the uh, the growth because you do have to grow. It's a fast growing area. Although I, I know this plateaued a little bit, but you know some of the countries um, are really doubling down and their growth is quite remarkable if you look at the number of new jobs that they're creating. Both of you mentioned uh, regulation uh, at various points. And then at least one of the themes, and I'd probably say two of the themes in the strategy, touch on responsible quantum and the sort of the larger political context for quantum. What needs to be, and what needs, I'm gonna, the question is what needs to be regulated in this? We're gonna come back and talk about tech transfer after this, but when you think about regulation, what does it need to regulate? Because there are not that many, well, that's not fair. There are some commercial deployments, particularly in healthcare and sensing. What needs to be regulated? That's the good question, isn't it? And that's what we're yeah, going to make sure. But Joanne, you look like you're about to say something there. You're on mute still. Oh, you're muted. My you can't have a Zoom call without one mute. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. It's got to happen at some point. Um, my starting point when it comes to any new and emerging tech, tech and a question of regulation is to say, well, let's also um, put a put a marker down and say, uh, existing laws apply. And I do think this is really important. We're seeing it in the AI debate now. And it, that is really important when you're looking at a fast moving and evolving technology. So that's the that's the first thing. If you're talking about uh, evolution and medical tech, well, all of the normal procedures that apply when you're rolling out a new medical device uh, and uh, or a new medical uh, invention apply to quantum as with others. So then the question, which is more what you're getting to, um, Jim, is what what new or what more do we need to have in this space? And I think that's um, that's where Kathy's observation uh, in the strategy about 
or having responsible use of um, quantum computing um, really will become important. Um, and, you know, the World Economic Forum has done some preliminary work in this space with a set of principles which are, um, you know, providing that guidance. And one of the things that they actually called out at the start of that was, well, why do we need these and why do we need them now? And the point that they made is, well, we know that this technology is coming. We know enough about the potential of this technology. We know that, that the horse has not yet bolted. So we do actually have an opportunity to put some guardrails around this. And we also have, thirdly, enough of an ecosystem to actually start having this conversation. So I think it's about saying, okay, if we are going to have totally game-changing technology, we say we do get this error-corrected error quantum computer, um, how, how will that change the rules of the game? Um, there are, for me, I guess, some uh, particular questions from an international security perspective, particularly around um, post-quantum encryption and, um, and being able to break current encryption and what the rules uh, are uh, would be around that. I think um, that that's sort of a race to who gets there first. Um, so I, I think there are many areas, but my starting point is is always the existing frameworks that we have to prevent harm in society apply, and then what do we need to do to add in addition? Um, and most importantly, I think the most important regulatory changes we need at the moment are those that facilitate investment uh, and, mm -hmm. and, and international cooperation on a really pragmatic basis, so sort of taking it through the, um, through the full spectrum from esoteric to practical. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's really important. And also just with a little bit more digging down into some of the detail, um, one of the things is uh, working out where alliances might assist assist with uh, being able to grow um, the movement of, of capability, knowing that there's the potential for safe um, IP management as well as um, safety for for um, making sure that it doesn't end up into bad actors' hands. So that's that's one thing. But if you go through looking at the potential, and this is, as Joanna said, is we've got a bit of a runway here. It's not like it's, if we think of social media, it's sort of just turned up really fast and, and really started having a whole lot of impacts which were unintended and not necessarily thought of uh, and therefore not, not really planned for. And so we're trying to go back and put the genie back in the bottle in some cases, you know, particularly with things like cyberbullying and stuff like that, and the, and the impact on children or on um, uh, mental health, things like that. So if you go through looking at uh, communication security, uh, internet is potentially, uh, or internet security is potentially vulnerable if we get a full error corrected quantum computer. So what does that look like? Uh, and then that has impacts on data security. So um, will there be a requirement? And we've seen in the USA that there's already some um, an executive order from your president saying that companies have to start thinking about what is their um, data security plan. Um, and then I guess it's understanding what the threat landscape looks like. So that if you were to imagine the realization of a full error corrected computer that could um, have uh, the potential to um, decrypt uh, information which is part of our everyday operations globally for the economies, what does that mean and how are we going to be prepared for that? And as I said, there's 16 countries that are all in, but um, but what about all the other ones who are also part of the economic trade? Um, we need to make sure that that's, that's navigated potentially. And so, you know, that's looking at, um, you know, the laws and the policies that have to be in place. And that goes back also looking at uh, the critical infrastructure to support that, uh, because it's not as though regulation is just something which uh, is written in a law, but it's usually, particularly with tech, it has to be backed up by uh, you know, uh, standards, uh, tra um, tra tradable and, um, and uh, accepted ones. And these take a long time. Anyone who's been involved in standards development knows that you're talking about a decade at least to really get that nutted down. Because that's the beauty of them is that they bring the whole, you know, all different countries together, and um, and being able to get agreement so that we can have free trade or, um, or or safe trade, and so they're the sorts of things that we really need to think about now rather than having this pop up and say, oh dear, what did we do? Why didn't we think of this? Why didn't we prepare for it? Yeah, and if I can, go ahead, go ahead, Joanna. Yeah. 
briefly add to that. I think one of the things we really need to be spending, um, you know, get some some of the best and brightest minds thinking about is how do we actually incentivize um, incentivize putting proper regulatory rules at an international level around um, what happens when we do have uh, error corrected quantum computing for those issues that Kathy was talking about in terms of global finance, the economy, um, security. Um, you know, countries like uh, the US, uh, Australia, you know, we're going to be of like minds on this. How do we actually incentivize having a sensible conversation and a, and a meaningful, impactful conversation about this type of thing with China as well? This is the, the this is actually the real, uh, I know, Jim. <laughs> that, that's up to you guys. We're not doing so well in that department at the moment. But it, but if we are talking about having meaningful <clears throat> regulation in that space, it won't be meaningful or impactful unless we include China in that conversation. So just um, flagging that, flagging the obvious. <laughs> yeah, no, it's 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 a. I think there's a you know, there's a sort of narrative that the U.S. wants to confront China and has some truth to it, but it also there's a strong incentive to try and find ways to talk to them, and we're kind of rebuffed all the time. Uh, that doesn't always come out in public. So maybe it will fall on other countries' hint uh, to take up that dialogue. But uh, I know NIST has done a fair amount of work on standards and post-quantum uh, mm -hmm. cryptography. Uh, it's probably a safe bet that all the major intelligence services are recording and storing traffic for later decryption when it comes to uh, when quantum techniques become available. Uh, I've certainly seen that in the past. Um, there's concern in the US about particularly quantum sensing, uh, some, some sensing, some concern over timing because of its effect, its benefits to navigation, but sensing could affect stealth and anti-submarine warfare. And so the immediate reaction, at least from some parts of the US government is, um, we have to look at tech transfer, we have to clamp down. Um, some, I even heard one defense official say that no quantum technology should be allowed to leave the US. It should all be done within government facilities. That's not gonna happen. But when it comes to thinking about tech transfer and places like China, um, what's the take in Australia? Well, the, um, I think the first thing is we've got to remember we're a small country and so that we, can, we have a small market so uh, if we're going to have a, a quantum industry, it's actually an export industry. And we have to figure out how to do that in a way that is not going to cause us things we, uh, you know, problems down the line. So, uh, so, that's, so uh, that's going to be really important. That's where some of those um, uh, countries which are like-minded in areas which we're, we're considering here our, um, uh, we, we, we have to work our way through what they look like. And you will see that things like Quad and um, the AUKUS agreements between um, different uh, multilateral countries is that it's, um, quantum is always listed as one of the critical texts there. So these are both very early stages in their um, e evolution. And so that's part of the discussion of saying, what does that look like? So I don't want to preempt it because they're, you know, they're, they're discussions for governments to have. But what's really important is that they have those discussions and work out what is needed um, because it's, to, to some extent, you've got to be careful that this is a, a, a pervasive technology. So it's not something hmm. that you're going to keep in a box and keep it safe, shrouded by you know, the walls of a country. You've got to realise that this is going to be something which will be out every day in time to come. Uh, not now, and um, but it will be, and it's something where uh, we've got to be smart about this and not be sort of trying. I think sometimes we put big fences around things instead of saying, "How can we use innovation to actually set things up so that they are able to be used safely or be able to uh, be um, uh, sort of promote but protect sort of thing, and um, and get that balance right." Look, it's easy to say the words. I'm, I'm, I know that uh, it is hard to live live that, and it's something where uh, you have to really do deep thinking. I think uh, talk about things that can be uncomfortable, and uh, and be very much in partnership with uh, with the countries that you want to work with on this, so that you end up with a benefit. I think 
probably no country in the world wants to say um, say that we want to do things that are going to not be a benefit. But I think what we need to understand is um, everyone's idea of benefit at the expense of others is something where uh, we don't necessarily have alignment and that's where things come unstuck. And so how do we actually use this as a chance to maybe do things a bit differently to what we've done in the past? Because we do have a long runway. We've got some you know, early deliverables along the way. And I suspect that part of the reason why we're approaching it differently to previous, the, you know, the way technologies have developed in the past is just because of the open communication we have now. Um, you know, the fact that we can have a, a, a video conference like this um, is something we wouldn't have done at the beginning of this, um, any of the first quantum revolutions, the start of lasers and, and chips and then computers and internet. But, but they've sort of allowed us to have much more integration of, of engagement. And I think this is going to be interesting to see how that plays out societally. So this is where I think we have to realise that there's a strong social science aspect to this that we need to bring in and uh, really work closely with people who think about the human interaction side of it and, uh, and not just leave it to the tech heads to do that. And that's something which I hope that we'll achieve with our quantum strategy here. You want to add to that, Johanna? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd just reiterate the points about, um, you know, for Australia, um, closing the borders and doing quantum uh, purely within our sovereign territory is not really a realistic proposition, nor, frankly, you know, if you go back to Kathy's point that 10% of um, the world's quantum scientists that were trained in Australia, is it a realistic proposition for the rest of the world? So I think it is a question of, um, you know, we, who are you going to partner with? Uh, AUKUS Pillar 2, which never gets very much attention. We always talk about the submarines, but of course, Pillar 2 um, is a technology transfer uh, mechanism designed to focus on that uh, on this exact issue. Um, and the Quad's doing some work in this space as well. Um, I, I think probably um, of a of a slightly to a slightly lesser granularity than what is happening uh, within uh, within AUKUS. Um, and I think so. It is important. Also, it's difficult to walk away from a panel about quantum, especially one hosted by Jim Lewis, without feeling a sense of impending dread. You know, like the, the security implications of what of what could happen with this. Um, so I don't. I I just mean you. You are very focused on the security aspects of it. I think it's also important, though, that we remember many of the applications of quantum are really positive for humanity you know there's a made the potential for amazing advances in medicine and individualized medicine there is the potential for amazing advances in um you know addressing uh the impact of emissions and climate change and so whilst when we're looking through it through it for a security focus absolutely we need to be careful and conscious of of who and what we're cooperating with make sure we've got those boundaries in place but also be conscious that the more we put those boundaries in place the more we're encouraging the race um the arms race if we're going to call it in that context um but also to remember that there are these positive applications which everyone every country has an incentive to cooperate to address things like climate change um and i didn't mean to disparage your security focus Jim. no no i i've had a conversion experience so i'm actually closer to kathy now oh perfect i haven't seen you for too long <laughs> yeah it just you were the chinese are going to be there no matter what we do they're not going away it's not the 20th century this comes as a shock to some of my colleagues in the security agencies we can't build walls around things so it's really an issue if you want security, it's who best sees, creates and seizes the opportunities. Mm. So that's a very different focus. And it's not, I, I don't even like to talk about export controls anymore because they're, they're so 20th century. Um, yeah. we're, we're at the end of our time. We, have, we actually have a few minutes left. I was going to ask you about workforce, but I'll, I'll defer to you two. Do you want to talk about workforce briefly? Or do you want to get your day back? I just want to talk about workforce for a second, is that there's not enough girls in quantum. Uh, this is something that's a huge issue. There's only about 5% women in the quantum in the quantum workforce. It's terrible. And if we really want to make sure that all the things we talked about are happening, we've got to have the full human potential uh, because uh, that different perspectives bring better outcomes, get better results. The consequences are taken into account. And uh, as well as there's a whole lot of brilliant young women there who are our future, 
and we're just not giving them a chance. So if we're talking about workforce, we've got to make sure we do that. And we also have to recognize that we've got a real problem. Uh, you know, the pop world population is uh, going to, uh, of workers is going to stagnate in 2030. And so we've got to really think about how to bring people along who might not normally think that this is a career pathway for them. They don't have to be a quantum physicist. In fact, the number of quantum physicists will drop, but the quantum tech people will grow. So having you know vocational, educated, trained people who are quantum specialists on, on their bits to make it all work is, uh, you know, for those who aren't necessarily interested in deep maths and quantum mechanics, there's a lot of real technical work that's there and it's quite they're quite transferable skills too so when we're talking about workforce that's something and also bringing on developing countries so for example the asia pacific area southeast mm -hmm. asia and even pacific nations which um because that's a real focus at the moment for globally is that um they're under a lot of threat so changes in um in the way that, they, for example, fruit, many um, people from the Pacific Islands go to countries for fruit picking. Now that's all going to be automated. And so what's going to be their livelihood? And things which can be done remotely, like IT um, programming, that sort of stuff, is, um, is something that could be done if we set it up right. They've actually got pretty good internet connection because of a satellite that Norway put up. So it's something where there's, uh, you know, there's a potential for us to really see how, how we can just think differently about workforce, uh, make sure it's, uh, we, we get diversity and inclusion, but also look at where we might be able to source uh, people from, which means we have to invest in their education, their early stage education in those countries as well to support them. So that's me for workforce. What about you, Joanna? <laughs> Uh, I just say here, here to to more diversity, but also particularly to encourage more women and girls into the field. Absolutely. Yeah, we've had we one of our uh, uh, earlier podcasts was uh, three uh, women physicists. Like one was Georgia Tech, one was IBM, and one might have been I can't remember. It might have been Yale, but it's like so. It's an it, there are some impressive folks out there. Uh, oh, we yeah. try we we strive for balance, but um, <laughs> with that. Uh, and I don't know if that will make it into the final cut. Let me thank you both for taking the time to talk about this. This is a, it's thank a subject that continues to fascinate people. So thank you. Thank you.